For dial-up users in the 1990s, speed was king. There was always a desire to go faster with the latest modem speeds and standards. But there was one technology that had an almost mythical status. We're talking, of course, about T1. But what exactly is a T1 line anyway? That's what we'll be finding out today on the serial port. We're taking a detailed look at this surprisingly old technology, and we will be setting up our very own T1 line for our ISP's internet access. Hi, this is with AT&T Business Sales. How may I help you? We'll also delve into routers and routing technology to take another step towards getting our ISP fully operational. The concept of a fast, always-on connection to the internet was something of a pipe dream for any household in the early to mid-90s, as well as for many businesses. Dial-up was by far the standard for accessing the internet during this time, and the race for speed was measured in advances of kilobits a second. A T1 line, however, offered a staggering 1.54 megabits per second. This was over 53 times faster than a 28.8 kbps modem. And not only that, it was always on. There was no dialing, no waiting for a connection. It was simply on and connected to the net. And as you endlessly waited for your 28.8 kbps modem to download a file, the T1 could do the same in mere seconds. Dial-up connections were not totally reliable either. As someone on a shared line might pick up a phone and knock the connection offline, You hooked it up to the phone, didn't you? While a T1 was a dedicated line designed for 24 seven commercial use. And finally, it wasn't just the speed, but the latency was significantly lower, making your online experience feel that much more real time. And during the early to mid nineties, a T1 connection was essential when launching an ISP. It could accommodate hundreds of modem users simultaneously. And one of the advantages of running or even just working for an ISP back then was enjoying access to that lightning fast connection. But how did it actually work? T1 is part of the broader T carrier system. It was developed in the late 50s and introduced in 1962 to modernize the telephone carrier system in the United States. Prior to the introduction of the T1, the phone system was completely analog. And this had shortcomings when it came to carrying more and more phone traffic on existing infrastructure. So AT&T Bell Labs devised a method of digitizing phone calls that was simply called digital signal. There are a lot of technical details that we won't get into now, but the important thing to know is that a phone call was sampled at 8,000 times a second, or 8 kilohertz, and each sample contained 8 bits or 1 byte of information. This resulted in a bit rate of 64 kilobits per second. This was called Digital Signal Zero or DS Zero. But the T1 carrier system did something called multiplexing or specifically TDM or time division multiplexing. This allowed many DS Zero signals, 24 to be exact, to be combined or multiplexed into a single digital transmission called Digital Signal One or DS One. But why only 24? Why not 48 or 96? There were later T carrier schemes like T3 that did support a higher number of channels, but during T1's development, Bell Labs conducted testing through the existing infrastructure and found that a happy compromise was equivalent to 24 DS0 signals. And since we know that a single DS0 signal is 64 kilobits a second, 24 DS0 signals results in a data rate of 1,536,000 bits per second or 1.536 megabits per second. But hold on a minute, we said T1 is 1.54 megabits per second though. Why the difference? Well, to answer that, let's see what a T1 transmission actually looks like. As we said earlier, T1 uses time division multiplexing to combine 24 DS0 signals into a single transmission called DS1. This transmission is constructed into frames. A single frame contains the 24 DS0 signals arranged into what are called channels or time slots. And we know that each DS0 signal contains 8 bits of data. So if you multiply that by 24 channels, you get 192 bits for each frame. But in order to tell each frame apart from one another, there needs to be an extra framing bit that marks the beginning of a new frame. So now that's 193 bits for each frame. And T1 is transmitted at 8,000 frames a second, which is the 8 kilohertz we saw with the DS0 signal. So now we can finally calculate the full data rate 
as 193 bits times 8,000, which equals 1,544,000 bits a second, or 1.544 megabits per second. But since that extra bit is used for framing, the maximum we can actually use for data transfer is still only 1.536 megabits per second. And conventional T1 is transmitted over four copper wires, one twisted pair for receiving and one twisted pair for transmitting. And this is the same copper wiring that was running to every household and business built with access to telephone service. And this is exactly what the original ARPANET, the precursor to the internet used. Except back then in 1968, they were releasing a single DS0 channel between nodes at a measly $49,000 a year per node. And it wouldn't be until the late 80s that the NSFNet backbone was finally upgraded to the full T1 bandwidth. But what did it mean to actually get T1 service? What was involved and how did you actually connect it to your network? If you wanted a T1 connection to the internet or what is many times referred to as a leased line, two parties would need to be involved. The first is the telco or telephone company in your area that would provision a T1 circuit from their CO or central office through the physical infrastructure to your location. And while the telco was responsible for the T1 drop itself, they often did not offer internet access on it. This is where a national or regional ISP like UUNet, Netcom, and others would come into the picture. Or, as we heard from Pete Ashdown in episode 1, some universities offered T1 access as well. And the ISP would typically order or coordinate the T1 circuit from their closest point of presence, or POP, to the customer premises. Depending on the location of the ISP's POP and the customer, this could get expensive as it may need to traverse across several telco central offices. And prices varied considerably for T1 service over the years. But to give you an idea, we found an issue of Network World from 1997 that showed T1 prices averaging around $2,000 to $2,500 a month. There would typically be an initial setup fee as well, presumably to handle setting up the T1 drop from the telco. And as part of that setup, the telco would install a T1 network interface unit, or as it's most commonly called, a smart jack at your location. This establishes something called a demarcation point or DMARC, where the telco's equipment and responsibility ends and the customer premises equipment or CPE begins. And the smart jack is typically a lockable box meant to be mounted on a wall that contains a transceiver card. The transceiver accepts the signal from what's called the span, meaning the outside copper wiring, from your location to the CEO, and then conditions it to connect to the CPE, as well as to allow for loopback testing from the CO to the smart jack. From there, it is up to the customer or their ISP to provide the equipment necessary to actually use the T1 for internet access. And this would be a device called a CSU-DSU, like the one we have here. The CSU part of this is called the channel service unit. Its function is to terminate and isolate the span power from the telephone lines and condition the signal. The DSU portion, called the data service unit, isolates the rest of the customer equipment from the provider's infrastructure, and vice versa. Its primary function, though, is to convert the T1 signal into a serial format like V.35, and vice versa. In reality, both of these devices are almost always combined into one unit, like in our ADTRAN. But enough theory, let's get our T1 line ordered. First, we tried calling AT&T. Hi, this is Snover with AT&T Business Sales. How may I help you? Hey, I uh, wanted to get internet access for my business and I'm specifically looking for something called a T1 connection. Okay, let me see here. What I'll probably need to do is set up a, a call with my, uh, my technical specialist on the back end because T1s aren't really something that we typically, actually, now that I'm looking at it, I just asked my specialist because it doesn't look like we sell T1s anymore. We do dedicated internet, but we don't do one specifically anymore. Next, we tried a local provider. Hi, how can I help you? Hey, I'm looking for internet access for my business. Um, specifically trying to find something called a T1. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's actually coming back. We currently don't have any available services for you, sir. Oh, no. 
And finally, as a last ditch effort, we tried calling an old number for SciNet. Thank you for calling the Medical Alert Center. This is Jessica on our recorded line. Can you hear me okay? Uh, hi, yes I can. Great. So uh, with our promotion today, you actually have the opportunity to receive a free medical alert device. So congratulations. Um, you know, it's that little button you wear around your neck that you press in case of an emergency. Or Unfortunately for us, most telcos are eliminating support for both new and existing T1s, as well as their copper wiring completely. Since we can't source a T1 locally anymore, we had to come up with another plan. We decided to hook up our own in-house T1 line fed from other equipment in the serial port lab. And this is real T1, meaning we have actual T1 frames heading to and from our CSU DSU that will provide access to the internet for the ISP. After a smart jack had been installed, you would often be provided with a circuit setup sheet as we see here. This provided all the information that you would need to configure the CSU DSU and router. The CSU DSU we have is an Adtran TSU 100E. The E in the model indicates it has an ethernet port, which is simply used for management of the unit itself through Telnet and not to actually exchange data over the T1. The same can be done on the front panel keypad using the two line LCD screen but the Telnet configuration is definitely easier and faster. Once we Telnet in, we can enter in our circuit settings. Our in-house T1 is using the ESF or extended super frame format with the B8ZS line code. And here are the individual DS0 time slots, which could be used for mixed mode networking with voice and video traffic. Along with the CSU DSU, our ISP also needs a router. The router will act as the middleman to forward IP traffic between our upstream ISP and our local Ethernet network. Cisco launched the iconic 2500 series of routers in 1993, with prices starting around $2,500, and they quickly became the go-to router for small ISPs. Dennis's ISP FAQ that we consulted in episode 1 called Cisco routers the benchmark at the time, the reference as to which other routers were judged and he recommended the 2501 to almost all startup providers. And the 2501 is still being talked about to this day, owing to their huge popularity over the decades. The router is powered by the Motorola 68030 clocked at either 20 or 25 megahertz. There are two high-speed serial V.35 interfaces and one 10 megabits per second ethernet interface as well. This would have been perfect for an ISP starting in the mid 90s. They could start with one T1 connection and then add a second one down the road for more capacity and redundancy. The 2500 series is described as a multi-protocol router and part of Cisco's success was in supporting many protocols such as IPX, DEC, and others. But for an internet provider, we only care about using it as an IP router and making the IP connection to our ISP. The 10 meg ethernet interface has an AUI connector. So we're using this Centercom transceiver to convert it to a 10 base T interface. And for the link to the CSU DSU, we're using a Cisco V.35 serial cable. The connector on the Adtran side is a large connector with chunky pins, referred to as a Winchester. Our cable goes from that to a DB60 interface on the Cisco. Now that our physical interfaces are hooked up, let's start configuring them. Since we configured the T1 circuit settings on the Adtran, all that's left to do on the Cisco router is to enter the IP address assigned from our upstream ISP. Speaking of IP addresses, as a new ISP, we are going to need quite a lot of them, both for our own systems as well as for assigning to users. Back in the mid 90s, it would have been straightforward to request IPs from an upstream ISP, as well as to get directly allocated IPs, also known as portable. The direct allocations here in the US would have been from Internic. They handled domain name and IP registrations during this time. The IP numbering role was later handed off to Aaron in 1997. A forward-thinking ISP would be starting their applications with Internic for both IPs and something called an Autonomous System Number, or ASN, which we'll talk more about shortly. We have secured a Class C network, also known as a Slash 24, that we'll be deploying on the LAN side of the router. So we're configuring the first address, 205.166.179.1, on the router, which will be the gateway for the rest of our hosts. And then on the LAN, we configured this Spark Classic with an IP in this slash 24 block, and we can successfully ping it from the router. And speaking of the Classic, our Patreon members are now enjoying the bounties of the early internet protocols. 
Spots are still available, so please consider supporting our mission if you'd like to get hands-on with the Classic. And as some of you recommended, we've reinstalled Solaris with version 2.5.1 to rewind the clock further back in the 90s. This workstation is at the very heart of our ISP, and now we're going to get it directly connected to the internet on a public IP. Temporarily, at least. Now, to interact with the internet, we'll need to configure our router to talk to our upstream ISP using the BGP protocol. BGP, or Border Gateway Protocol, is the protocol the internet uses today for networks to exchange routing information. It determines how all IP addresses on the internet are routed, meaning what path requests need to take through the vast internet infrastructure to reach a given IP. BGP version 3 was formalized in 1991 with RFC 1267, and it built on previous iterations of a protocol called EGP, or Exterior Gateway Protocol. In contrast to an IGP, or Interior Gateway Protocol, EGP or BGP is how independent networks called autonomous systems exchange IP routes between each other. And each autonomous system is assigned an ASN, a unique identifier for each AS. And by the end of 1994, there were only a total of 525 ASNs in active use. Compare that to today in 2023, there are now well over 100,000 ASNs in use. We want to send a route known as announcing or advertising from our Cisco 2501 to the modern internet today. So we're going to be configuring BGP version 4, which was formalized in 1994 in RFC 1654. Modern routes today still use BGP version 4, but with many improvements and extensions added on over the years. One of the benefits of implementing BGP is that it would let us implement multi-homing. That is, we can later add a second T1 internet connection to a different upstream ISP. By advertising our IP prefix to two ISPs, we would receive traffic on both connections under normal circumstances, and traffic would automatically reroute in case either one of those connections goes down. And the BGP configuration is actually very short and simple. In the Cisco configuration, we start BGP with the command router BGP, and then define our autonomous system number. We're using 961, which is an ASN that we have access to use. Next, we need to define the BGP neighbor that we want to connect to. In this case, it is our upstream ISP, and our ISP here is NetActuate at AS36236. They've agreed to provide us full internet connectivity for this project. Now that our neighbor has been defined, let's see if the BGP session comes up. And after giving it a few moments, it is now established. We can see that we have both sent and received BGP messages. And here we can see we've already learned a few routes from our BGP neighbor. Most importantly is the first route in the list, as that is the default route. Back in the early to mid 90s, the Cisco 2501 might have had a chance to actually process the full internet routing table when it contained just a few thousand routes. However, today, the full IPv4 routing table contains almost 1 million routes. Now we need to get our route advertised out to the internet with a few commands. With those settings in place, we can look at the bgp.tools website to confirm that our route is being advertised. Our nearest neighbor is our upstream ISP, followed by CenturyLink, and then tier one ISPs. And finally, let's see if we can ping from our router to the internet. With that, we finally completed our journey to establish the ISP's connection to the information superhighway. We may have had to make our own T1 along the way, but we're that much closer to being ready for dial-in users. On our next episode, we'll be taking a look at modems, and we'll be hearing from one of the creators of key technologies used by ISPs. So it ended up solving a problem that we never, ever anticipated when we started out. We just wanted to be able to connect boxes together. We'll also be conducting a terminal server shootout. Thanks for watching The Serial Port, and we'll see you again next time.